Uh, my new book is called All This Life. Uh, I'm, uh, I belong to this artist collective downtown called the Writer's Grotto. And every time I'm coming from the Mission District downtown, I see all those construction cranes looming over our city. Uh, and I always imagine them plucking up an artist and like moving her over here and then dropping like a Twitter employee down in her place. Uh, so by the time I get to work that day, I'm super mad about how things are changing in, in SF. Uh, and this book is you know, sort of a love letter for our town, uh, but also an indictment of, of what's happening outside these walls. A lot of what Brett was talking about at the beginning here. Uh, it's an ensemble novel, so we're following eight characters. I structured it like one of those cool old Robert Altman flicks, um, maybe like Nashville or something, where we've got seven or eight seemingly disparate storylines. We don't have any idea how the hell they're all going to converge by the time we get to the climax. If I've done my job right, um, they're all on stage at the same time. Uh, so I'll read from the beginning to give you a little, a little sneak peek. It's another brittle day, all of them inching over the Golden Gate Bridge into San Francisco. Their typical trek to clutter desks, schlepping with their hangovers, their NPR, carpools and podcasts, prescription pills and nicotine patches, their high-def depressions. LASIK so they can see all their designer disaffections, lipstick smeared on bleached teeth, bags under their eyes or Botox time machines, bald spots or slick dye jobs, bellies wedged in pants or carved Pilates bodies, their urges to call in sick, their woulda, coulda, shouldas, more rationalizations and regrets running through the air and cell signals. Nobody wants to get to work. Even those claiming to enjoy their jobs still bristle at the idea of oozing into ergonomic chairs, reviving computer screens, feeling the day's flickering chaos erupt on their faces. A couple extra hours of sleep. A half day telecommuting something other than the full slog. The particulars of their jobs don't even matter because all the variables lead to one delicate plea. Please. Give us a day off, a day to ourselves, a day to feel free, a day to be alive. But this is a morning without such clemency. And so there they sit in their hybrids in these sports cars and family sedans, eking a couple toes on the accelerator before hitting the brake again. Bumper to bumper, a Bluetooth chain gang. The posted speed limit is 45, which is a brutal joke at this time of day. It should say four or five. <laughs> Somebody needs to fix that fucking conjunctionless sign. And not only does the speed limit tease, so does the traffic zooming out of San Francisco, motoring next to them, by them, zipping right along at the 45 mile per hour clip. That drew some sighs from our commuters pining for U-turns and quick getaways and sordid adventures. A white Prius house is a father and his 14-year-old son. They keep away from each other in the morning, or rather Jake keeps away from his dad, his surly chauffeur. Jake knows the sad hierarchy. A Google search of his father's favorite things would not return the boy as a page one result. Jake has never understood what makes him so moody as they drive in together, and yet there's really no way his father could explain it. No way for the father to unpack adults' disappointments. It's impossible for the father to convey that he'd expected his life to amount to more than some middling stake in a PR firm, and it's too late to fix. How can he tell his only child that commuting is a kind of daily desolation? His mind always flapping to the past, even when it's the last thing he wants to remember. Being young. When he released his potential and passions and possibilities up into the air, freeing them like doves. His whole life ahead to watch all his dreams come true. How can he tell his son that becoming an adult is learning to live with your failures? Learning to dodge these dying birds as they thump back to earth. How do you say that to your boy? Jake, never trying to disrupt their frail truth, spends his time filming things out the window with his iPhone. 
stealing frames from people's lives, poaching and posting them online, his pieces of property. Yesterday he captured a woman flossing her teeth while steering with her elbows. The day before a guy with little scissors trimming his mustache like a bonsai tree. So far today's material has been a bunch of stinkers, but this is when Jake sees the brass band. They're just coming on to the bridge's walkway on the San Francisco side by the toll booths. They're moving toward Jake, playing their instruments, forming a roaming pack. Jake counts 12 of them. Three trumpet players, two saxophones, two clarinets, two trombones, a snare drum, a bass drum, and a tuba player. They're all done up in wild outfits, clothed in mismatched prints and clashing colors. The brass band plays its song and moves in some inhaling and exhaling choreography, and suddenly one of the trumpet players, a man, breaks free from the formation, moving over to the bridge's orange railing. Throwing his trumpet over the side, climbing the rail, folding his hands in prayer, leaping toward the ocean. Jake watches and records, records and watches, and it's not really happening. There's no way this is really happening, so he keeps filming. The brass band stops its forward progress. Jake has to crane his head backward to watch it through the car's back window because his father's ride inches toward the toll plaza. The brass band keeping its music going, then another runs from the pack. The paisley shirts, a butterfly collar, throwing her clarinet and heaving her body over the side. Then another trumpet player jumps, then one of the saxophonists, then a trombonist. Their dying dad, says Jake. I'll stop there. Thanks very much.